welcome from the Manhattan Beach Community Church, an interfaith and interdenominational church at the crossroads of life. We bring you portions of the Sunday morning service from our beautiful sanctuary at 303 South Peck Avenue in the community of Manhattan Beach. We are glad you are joining us for this special service, and we hope it will be a source of inspiration and direction for you in the days ahead. We also invite you to join us in person this coming Sunday morning or any Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. For more information about the church and its wide-ranging programs, please feel free to contact the church office at 310-372-3587. And now, our Sunday morning service. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. May we join together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, this is the day you have made. And as Jesus said, it was made for us. Made for us to set aside from the rest of our week, to keep special, to keep holy, reserved for our appreciation of things unseen, a time for reflection, for worship, thanking you for calling us together as a people, a community. Yet so often we come here breathless, stressed out, squeezing in an hour or so among our many activities. And this is a day just like that. We are in a busy season. Graduations, promotion ceremonies, proms, class trips to Disneyland, even to Washington, D.C., Little League playoffs and all-stars, and theater productions like The Wizard of Oz here on Peck Avenue. And of course, there is the ever-present reality of work and of economic concerns that have become especially pressing for so many in recent days. Help us to slow this thing down, to recover the meaning of being here, to set aside this time with you so that it can truly be appreciated. Help us to reflect on things eternal, to find the inner peace we need for healthy lives, and bring your healing presence to those of us who are experiencing problems with their physical health. And as we approach Father's Day next weekend, help us to remember that one of the most enduring metaphors for you is as a father. Jesus constantly used it to describe his relationship and ours with you. Remind all of us who have the wonderful opportunity to be parents of your example, the concern, the support, the forgiveness, the unconditional love, and the endless patience you have for your children. Actually, Lord, 
Remind all of us, parents or not, for these are the qualities that make us whole and keep us walking on your path. Let us now pray the words which Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. morning.
The scripture reading is rather lengthy today, and I'll try to make up for that by cutting down the sermon. He said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have fed on the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and make merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. Now the older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house and heard the music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked him what this meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Lo, these many years I have served you. You never disobeyed your command, and yet you never gave me a kid for I might make merry with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your living with harlots, you killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to make merry and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Doug Greer is one of my favorite people around here. He's not only helped me personally, but has helped all of us in so many ways. And one thing I like about Doug, last Sunday I came in. Well, it must be time now for that short sermon. So let's see if John is here. He might take note of this. Well, the story we read earlier from the Gospel of Luke is one that is very familiar to people. You don't even have to be a literate in the Bible to be familiar with the story that was read. When I was in college a few years ago, we had to memorize a dramatic reading for our speech class. And I vaguely remembered one called Melody in F which has, strangely enough, showed up in recent times in a couple of ways. So I went to the good old internet to see if I could retrieve this reading, and indeed it was there. Melody and F. It goes like this. I didn't memorize it. Feeling footloose and frisky, a feather-brained fellow forced his fond father to fork over the farthings and flew far to foreign fields and frittered his fortune feasting fabulously with faithless friends. Fleeced by his fellows in folly and facing famine, he found himself in a filthy farmyard. 
Fairly famishing, he fain would have filled his frame with foraged fodder from fodder fragments. Fooey, my father's flunkies fare far finer. <laughs> the frazzled fugitive frankly faced facts. Frustrated by failure and filled with foreboding, fled forthwith to his family. Falling at his father's feet, he forlornly fumbled, Father, I flunked. I've fruitlessly forfeited family favor. The far-sighted father, forestalling further flinching, frantically flagged the flunkies to fetch a fatling from the flock and fix a feast. The fugitive's fault-finding brother frowned on fickle forgiveness of former Falderall, but the faithful father figured, Filial fidelity is fine, but the fugitive is found. What forbids fervent festivity? Let flags be unfurled, let fanfares flare. So a father's forgiveness formed the foundation for the former fugitive's future fortitude. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> You've now heard the story twice. <laughs> and as you know, it focuses on three individuals. There's the father, there's the younger son, and there's the spoiled brat or older brother. The focus has traditionally been on the younger son, the one we call the prodigal son. And I can personally identify with that younger brother because I was the youngest of three boys in my own family, and I left home at the age of 18 to pursue my fame and fortune down on the Oregon coast. I didn't find it, of course. But following a frightening car wreck, which I've reported to you before, I came back to my parents' home to recuperate, start a different direction in my life. I felt that God had intervened to physically save my life, which could be argued either way, I suppose. But that's how I interpreted it. So I gave up my plans to study for a law degree, decided instead to go into the Christian ministry. And as I have undoubtedly stated before, I made the shift from law to grace. Well, the free and easy life that I led down on the Oregon coast was nothing like the one described here in the gospel parallel parable. And I did not have my share of the family fortune to fritter away. But I see myself in the younger brother, and I think that's probably true of a lot of people. And then there's this jealous, cantankerous, selfish older brother. Now, if this were an analogy, where each part of the story would represent something else, then the older brother would represent the Pharisees and the Sadducees, with their self-righteous, hang em high mentality. But this is not an analogy. It's a parable. And a parable only has one point to it. Now, actually, as an aside, and I'll get back to that one point, I had two older brothers who were nothing like the one in this story. While my oldest brother did stay at home, my other brother and I took off to pursue our own dreams. But that oldest brother was the most supportive and generous and encouraging brother that one could ask for. He and his wife would be the ones to stay there in the hometown and take care of our parents in their declining years and never grumbled or complained about the unfairness of it all, how they never got to go off and do their thing. A much better person than I will ever be. But the focus in this story is on the Father. That's the one Jesus is really talking about. Jesus several times refers to God as his Father. So he's obviously trying to tell us something here about God. Now, when we talk about God as Father, we must confront a couple of problems that such terminology presents. And the first of these is to think of God as the strict, 
stern disciplinarian to whom we must ultimately be accountable. Now that view of God comes to us out of centuries of traditional theology and paternal family patterns. So when I was a child, for example, I would sometimes hear my mother say, not very often given the type of child I was, you just wait till your father gets home. <laughs> I knew what that meant. It was not good news. Back in those days before Benjamin Spock, corporal punishment was quite common. I remember entertaining my mother's guests. You know how we bring the kids out, parade them in front of our guests. She taught me this little poem. When I was a little boy about so high, Mama took a little stick and made me cry. But now I'm a big boy, and Mama can't do it. So Daddy takes a big stick and hops right to it. <laughs> now, I appreciate your sympathy with this sort of thing. That's the way it was back in those days. So it was quite natural then for us to transfer that understanding of Father unto God. See, God is the one to whom we are ultimately responsible, and he is going to be stern and judgmental. The other problem which we do have in addressing God as Father is that of gender. Now, this is a relatively new thing, and it's only in the last century or so, with the painful progress that women have achieved, that the concept of God as Father has been successfully challenged. Today, thoughtful people are more likely to say that while God may be father, God may also be mother, nurturing, consoling, caring. And there are several scriptures you could quote to sustain such an idea. I'm aware of this, and I'm somewhat sympathetic with this until I'm confronted by some staunch feminist who can only accept God as mother. So we have a clergy gathering down in Long Beach a few years ago. One of the pastors was asked to say grace before the meal. He said, Dear Lord, we thank you for this food, and so forth and so forth. Your usual innocuous table grace. When he had finished, a woman minister jumped all over him and said, What do you mean, Lord? That's sexist. I was embarrassed for the poor guy, who was simply using language that was familiar to him, comfortable for him, and I was very glad they had not asked me to pray. <laughs> but here's the thing. God is neither male nor female. Those are categories that we use for humans and animals and plants. But God is none of those. The writer of the epistles of John says simply, God is love. I remember posters in Sunday school would say, God is love. I didn't know what that meant, but it gave me a kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling anyway. Now, when I grew older and started singing in church choirs, I learned a little Latin, which I had escaped all through school. One phrase, one song we sing is, Ubi caritas et amor, Deus ibi est, which you all know means, <laughs> where there is caring and love, God is there. Where there's caring and love, God is there. And I believe that. But it's hard for me to pray to love. I need to think of God as a person with whom I can have a relationship. Someone to listen to my complaints. Someone to consider my needs and wants. Someone to pat me on the back when I feel I've done something good. Someone to hold my hand when I'm hurting, confused. And someone who, like a true friend, 
will tell me when I'm doing something wrong. Now, that sounds very simplistic and naive, I know. But that's where I am. And that's where I've been for a long time. Having said all that, however, one must not go too far and fall into the trap of anthropomorphism. Now, that's one of the biggest words I know. <laughs> I don't get to use it very often. It's not quite as big as anti-disestablishmentarianism, but I have no idea what that means. Anthropomorphism simply means attributing to God the characteristics of humanity. It's making God like us. And we don't want to do that. When God becomes something more than energy, or God becomes nothing more than energy, or a life force, or a color, or a creative something or other, I can't personally relate to that. I need a God who's more like a person. I need to think of God in somewhat understandable terms. It seems to me this is what Jesus is saying in this parable, that God is a prodigal father, or like a prodigal father, if you prefer. Oh, well, wait a minute. What about this prodigal stuff? Prodigal, you don't find that word in the Sunday crossword puzzle. But according to the dictionary, prodigal means recklessly extravagant, giving or yielding profusely, lavishly abundant. Now, someone long ago decided that this story in Luke was about the younger son, so they called it the parable of the prodigal son. And I would, I haven't looked. But in most Bibles, right at the top of the page, it will say, Let's see if it's there. The prodigal son. I mean, there you have it. Someone decided that's what the story's about. But it's not really about the son, the younger son or the older son. The story is really about the father. It's about the prodigal father who's extravagant, lavishly abundant. My goodness, just... Start to think of all the things God gives us, even without us asking. From the very air that we breathe to the hearts with which we love. And even when we're irresponsible and wasteful, even when we are major, big-time screw-ups, God still loves us and cares for us and looks for us with longing for our return to him in meaningful relationship. And when we take that step, like this younger son, come to our senses, swallow our pride, recognize that life without God is empty and meaningless, we come back to him, he forgives our foolish ways, throws a big party up in heaven, says to anybody who will listen, see, I didn't give up on old Raymond, neither should you. Now, Now, let me say it right here, because some of you are wondering. I know this is not Father's Day. We're a week early. But I checked with Erin, and she gave me permission to develop this theme today. She could take a different tack next week. But I would be the first to admit that my acceptance of the idea of God as a prodigal, loving father is partly based on my good fortune of having a prodigal, loving, biological father. Now, those of you who have not been so blessed, and there are far too many, will have a more difficult con time with this concept. But God loves them just as much as any of us. Both John Calhoun and I had great fathers. And that may well be part of the reason that we've been in the pastoral ministry all these years. We can both relate lots of stories from our childhood and our formative years that continue to inspire and guide us even today. 
I'll share but one of these, which I don't think I've told too many times. A group of us neighborhood kids were playing out in the street and in the nearby yards. And I somehow threw someone's tennis ball into some shrubbery, and we couldn't find it. The kid who owned the ball was quite upset. He said, well, your old man's going to have to get me another one. And I said, I don't have an old man. He turned to the other kids and he said, what's he talking about? He's got an old man, doesn't he? I said, I have a father, but I don't have an old man. And then as little boys are wont to do, I went home and sat on the front porch step and began to cry. Well, my dad was, I guess, nearby because before I knew it, he was sitting there beside me with his arm around me and asked me what was wrong. And I told him the whole story, how one of the boys referred to him as my old man. He said, son, I'm proud of you. Don't worry about the lost ball. We'll get another one. Now, with that kind of a father, you see, it's not hard for me to think of God as a loving father concept that comes out of my own experience. In an even deeper way, it's out of his experience that Paul can write in Romans, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us all things with him? Recklessly extravagant, giving profusely, lavishly abundant, a prodigal father indeed. It is as the great John Newton would write in his hymn, it's amazing grace. Or as Charles Wesley would write, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? A benediction somewhere in the gospel says, the writings of Paul, I think. Now to him, who is able to give us exceedingly abundant, above all we ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. You can join me then in the benediction we're going to read together. If you'll turn to page 11 in the hymnal. You'll find there a litany, which we'll use as our benediction, called Names of God Litany. For you non-liturgists, I'll try to read the light print and you read the dark. O oh God, because you are the source of all life and love and being, because we know the history of your presence among your covenanted people and honor their tradition, because our Savior, Jesus Christ, your obedient child, knew you intimately and spoke of you so, because you're present in the act of birth and because you shelter, nurture, and care for us, because you hold us up and give strength and courage when we are weak and in need. Because we have known you in our pain and suffering. Because beyond pain lies your promise of all things made new. Because you are the means of liberation and the way to freedom. Confident that you will hear we call upon you with all the names that make you real to us, the names that create an image in our minds and hearts, an image that our souls can understand and touch. And yet we know that you are more than all of these. Blessing and power, glory and honor be unto you, our God. Amen.
We are pleased that you have joined us for the Sunday morning service from the Manhattan Beach Community Church, an interfaith and interdenominational congregation. We hope that the music and the spoken word have lifted your spirits and have offered guidance and a sense of direction for your life. Have a wonderful week.